Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. We're not sure what time that you're joining us, but we are very excited to be here and very honored that we were selected to share this information with you and be a part of the Exceptional Children's Conference this year. Um, so we're going to jump right in. I'm going to provide a little introduction to myself and Katie Zinger is as well. And then we're going to share lots of good information about concussion management in youth with learning disabilities today. So my name is Dr. Ashley Harbin. I'm a medical clinical psychologist, specially trained to work with um, children, adolescents, and adults with complicated health issues. And about 85, 90% of my practice is um, people with concussions. Um, so Katie. Thank you, Ashley. Um, glad to be here today. It's morning where we are um, in time. My name is Katie Zenger. I have a master's degree in public health, and I serve as the project coordinator for the grant that allowed us all to be here and provide these resources today. So I work with the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina, and this, um, as you can see here at the bottom, the Brain Injury Safety Net is our program. This is our fun little logo that we've created. So today I'm here to tell you just a little bit about the overarching pieces of the program, but um, Ashley's really our content expert who's gonna be able to provide you with that concussion management for youth with disabilities and um, be able to provide you with that, those great resources. So for um, the past two and a half years, we have had a fantastic grant, luckily from the Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina Foundation um, to do what we're calling the South Carolina Brain Injury Safety Net. So basically this program is all about making sure that we have up-to-date resources for professionals and families available online and available through conferences like this one and, um, uh, and hard copies of materials for those who need it. Uh, we are building this in order to make sure that people are up to date on what you need to do when a young person is recovering from a concussion or also known as a mild TBI, which Ashley will explain later. So this program model is a little different. Obviously what we're trying to get to is school-aged adolescents and children in South Carolina who experience a TBI or traumatic brain injury. But really in order to best do that, we are targeting the resources that we're developing to all of these other little circles you see here. So families and parents are incredibly important. They're the ones with the kid goes home with a concussion. They're the ones who have to navigate the healthcare system for their kid, or they're the ones who have to watch those symptoms and know what to do with them. Healthcare providers, obviously incredibly important, and especially like Ashley, mental healthcare providers. Um, educators like you, 504 specialists, anyone who is a classroom teacher, you are the ones who really see the kids and how they're progressing, especially in terms of their return to learn progress. So y'all are very important. School nurses and school psychologists are key. Athletic trainers in South Carolina have been a really big proponent of not just looking at um, students and their return to play, but looking at their return to learn and being advocates for their mental brain health in, the, um, in their return to the classroom. So We've been lucky to work with the South Carolina Athletic Trainers Association with that. And then of course, anything we do, we wanna make sure policymakers have all the right information so that they can make good policies that support schools in making sure kids get a full recovery from a concussion. Next. So this is basically, how are we doing this? How are we getting this information out? What's the point? Again, the point is to improve those health outcomes and improve access to care for any school age children and adolescents who experience a traumatic brain injury in the entire state of South Carolina. So we're working on expanding our reach and making sure that we have an interdisciplinary group of champions who can make sure that the people who need to understand recovery from a concussion in children actually know what to do and are using the best newest uh, science backed uh, practices. So that's our core, that's our task force, those champions, right? So we're building relationships across discipline to, in order to have impact um, long-term on all of the different people that need to help kids as they recover from a concussion. And then our big one, this is today, the, are these next two, which is create and distribute the South Carolina specific resources for families, students, educators, and health professionals, and then promote and expand the use of high quality, up-to-date concussion management resources. Because so much has happened in the past five to 10 years about adolescent brain science, that really the way that many health professionals, especially were 
taught to treat concussions is actually the opposite of what we want to do. Like for instance, cocooning and stuff. So Ashley will explain a little bit about that, but it's really imperative that in order to have the best health outcomes for our young people, we, have, we provide the providers with the right, most up-to-date information. So one of those big resources, the most, the one we're most proud of right now here in South Carolina is called the, the REIT manual. So you can see it here. If you can see my camera, I've got my beautiful beat up copy here. It's a full color, gorgeous color coded manual that stands for Re remove, reduce, or E for educate, A for adjust and accommodate, and P for pace. And that is a process that you go through um, in order to make sure that the you're managing the concussion well in a young person. So this is a great manual resource. I'll talk about it at the end. And we have hard copies available for any professionals in South Carolina that want one. So um, at the end, please email me and looking forward to making sure you have the REIT manual in your hands if you need it. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> um, so now I'm gonna launch into lots of detailed information. Um, the first one is I'm gonna make my case about why everyone should care about concussions and mild traumatic brain injuries. Um, this is not just an athletic issue and you will hear us talk about that a lot today. Um, this is really a childhood and adolescent issue and that everyone involved in the schools should be interested in learning more, we think. Um, so here's some facts, prevalence data, um, obviously in every field oftentimes has its obstacles, but we do know a lot about how common these types of injuries really are. So a traumatic brain injury is the leading cause of death and disability for children ages one to 19, and it costs our country $1 billion a year. 85% of all brain injuries are classified as mild, 13% are moderate and 2% are severe. So those classifications that mild, moderate and severe are related to traumatic brain injuries. So those are not classifications of concussions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit, but those are based on what's called the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is all about symptoms documented immediately following an injury and particularly related to loss of consciousness. Um, here's another one that I find particularly interesting is that after one concussion, and that's the same thing as a mild traumatic brain injury, that a child is three to six more times likely to have another. And that's true across the age range. Mild traumatic brain injuries are also concussions, make up 70 to 90% of all emergency department visits for TBI. So that pretty much matches up with the data that we see above in terms of the frequency of mild TBI. But it's so important to know that we've also have data documenting the fact that 66% of high school students admit that they didn't even report a mild TBI. Half of all the patients with TBI or concussion are between the ages of 15 and 34, half of them. The annual incidence of sports-related concussions in the US has been documented to be between 1.6 and 3.8 million every year. The likelihood that an athlete is gonna sustain a concussion if they play a contact sport is about as high as 20%. 45% of emergency department visits in children are related to brain injuries from contact sports. And that was from a large data collection organized by the CDC. But I love to flip these percentages on their head and call your attention to the fact that that means that 55% of brain injuries that are seen in the emergency department are not related to contact sports. So concussions are important to schools for a lot of different reasons. These are not just a medical issue. They're not just an athletic issue. Um, they have short and long-term consequences for schools. So here's another percentage that I'm gonna flip for you all just to call your attention to it, which is that we keep data, keeps documenting the fact that 70 to 80% of all concussions will recover fully in three to four weeks. That means symptoms are completely gone 
but 20 to 30% will not. We have a lot of new treatment guidelines and Katie referenced this a minute ago. Um, you know, we used to keep children and adolescents just what we call cocooned, you know, stay at home until you're completely symptom free. So think about that in reference to that first statistic that I presented. That means that at first and for many years actually, that children and adolescents were kept home completely for three to four weeks. So we had different issues then. And now we have different issues as well because the new data tells us that this is not a good idea to keep students home completely resting in a dark room, stuck with their mom and dad for a month. Instead, we have real guidelines about sending students back to school within even a few days of their injury. So this is fabulous, but it also puts a huge burden on schools to know what to do from day one. Long-term considerations, 14% of students with mild TBI or concussion still need educational support services after one year due to persistent symptoms and deficits and disabilities. So this often requires a 504 plan, an IEP, or changes to pre-existing academic plans. This last, these last statistics I think are particularly noteworthy and, and again, encourage me to um, get you to keep thinking about things from every different perspective, which is that children with a history of brain injury are more likely to have conditions like learning disorders, ADHD, speech and language problems, developmental delays, and also orthopedic issues. Um, so, although the vast majority of our presentation today is going to be about managing new injuries, it's also important to ask whether or not a child has a history of a brain injury who's in your class because it might make their needs more unique than if their learning issues were acquired before birth. So you've already heard me talk a lot about these terminologies and I'm gonna spend a little bit more time making sure that we're all operating with the same vocabulary. Um, so what is a concussion really? It's not a structural injury. And this is so confusing for so many people. They'll come to me and say, well, the emergency department dropped the ball. They told me there was nothing wrong. We did a CT scan or an MRI and everything looked clean. Well, those sorts of tests are created to identify structural problems like a brain bleed or a skull fracture. Um, but instead a concussion is a functional problem. So I can talk about brain chemistry all day, but I don't really think that that's a, an important use of our time today, but just to know that it's about the way that your neurons are functioning and communicating with each other, which is why oftentimes we see the difficulties in concussion patients when they try to use their brain or when their neurological system is taxed in some way. The other thing that's super important to know is that you can get a concussion without even hitting your head against anything. A concussion can happen when your body experiences a jolt. Like if you're in a motor vehicle accident and you have whiplash and your body is slung around, your brain is actually moving in that cerebral spinal fluid within your skull. So there's a lot of sloshing and squeezing and squishing going on that can also affect your brain functioning. The last thing I wanna call your attention to is that concussions can cause changes in physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral functioning. And all of those can affect a child's ability to be successful in the classroom and can affect their daily functioning at home. So I laughed as I was pre uh, preparing for this presentation again, because I literally spent 15 minutes with a new patient this week explaining all of these different terms because she was so confused and had gotten so much different information from different medical providers. So here we go. A mild traumatic brain injury is the same thing as a concussion, okay? Um, oftentimes it depends on who you're talking to and the severity of the injury that someone experienced. Um, as I mentioned before, the classification of mild, moderate, and severe traumatic brain injury is related to the symptoms at the time of injury. It has nothing to do with the type or severity or duration of symptoms after injury. A mild TBI is an MTBI. These are different from moderate to severe. 
um, a traumatic brain injury is only one type of acquired brain injury. So you can have brain injury from things like lack of oxygen, poisoning, or brain tumor that can also result in impaired function in the brain. This one is particularly confusing for people when they're told, well, I have post-concussion syndrome. Honestly, it's not a term that I use very often personally. Um, and in a lot of ways, it should be reserved for someone who has treatment resistant or atypical symptom patterns that extend far beyond their physical recovery. Um, so there are lots of psychological variables involved in post-concussion syndrome. It doesn't at all mean that someone is faking it or malingering. It just means that their symptom clusters have exceeded what was expected. Um, but you really shouldn't see someone getting diagnosed with post-concussion syndrome the week after they get injured because then they just have a concussion. They're just experiencing concussion symptoms. Um, and this presentation is not at all about CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, but lots of people have heard about this on the news. It's not or the movie with Will Smith, Concussion. It's not something that's quite as prevalent in the media these days as it was a couple years ago, but I have lots of families come to me and they worry, does my child have CTE? Are they gonna have CTE? Well, CTE is something that happens after years and years and years of concussions. And this is something that has gotten a lot of attention in terms of professional football players. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful about repeated injuries but rarely in children and adolescents are we even thinking about something like CTE. Um, so why do concussions matter? Um, why should you all be interested? Again, this is not just an athletic issue, even though that was really what started this conversation a couple years ago, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Um, all children go to school, even though not all of them play sports. Um, and unfortunately, there's quite a bit of variability in access to athletic trainers. So for, for the last 10 years, maybe athletic trainers have been some of the leaders in this field in terms of staying up to date and providing day-to-day -day support and education for children and families after they sustain a concussion. Um, but there are lots of schools that don't have as many athletic trainers and there are lots of children who wouldn't even get connected with an athletic trainer because their injury didn't occur at a school related sport. Um, so what this means is that not every child has access to best practices in concussion management. And this is particularly true, unfortunately, in a state like South Carolina. We're not always the, the leader of the pack in terms of um, education and resources about rapidly evolving issues. Um, but this one in particular can have a significant impact on the way that we manage concussion recoveries. Um, but we do know this, that all children have access to a teacher and almost all children in our state have access to a school nurse, which is why obviously we have spent so much time with our grant trying to make sure that we are providing educational resources to all these different partners. Because our goal ultimately is that fewer and fewer children fall through the net. That's why we named our grant what we did, um, because we know that there are lots of children who are not getting the services that they need. And we really wanted to make, do everything we could to reduce that number. We do know this as well, that lack of information really increases anxiety. Um, and there are lots of, of children and families who make it to me and they've never gotten basic information about what a concussion is, all the things that we're gonna teach you about today. So we're really excited that you're gonna be able to help us in our effort to get more and more information to children and families. Um, because almost every scenario is incredibly manageable and that we have a much better chance of getting a child further along in their recovery more quickly if we put the supports and accommodations and interventions in place sooner rather than later. Um, because concussions affect school attendance and concussions also affect school performance. And this, this can have big consequences. Every spring I end up with patients who are concerned that they might not be able to graduate. And I've had children look at me and say, what if I can't go to college? Um, that's craziness for me. We should all make sure we have systems in place to make sure that that is not an additional anxiety when a concussion is already causing a lot of stress for a child and family. Um, there are also bigger, more global consequences to poor concussion management. 
and I see this every day, unfortunately, in terms of depression and anxiety, even suicidal ideation when a child feels like his or her life has completely fallen apart since an injury was sustained, like in a motor vehicle accident or even on the athletic field. Enormous family stress can occur, particularly when a family feels like they can't get answers to their most basic questions. And it's not unusual for medical bills to pile up and even for a parent to have to take a leave of absence from a job in order to make sure that a child gets to all of their medical appointments. So there are big consequences, there are small consequences, but there are also really big consequences that we need to remember. That's why we're here today to make sure that you have more information and that you can feel much more confident in your ability to meet these children where they are and provide for their needs. Um, so another thing that we have really learned a lot about in the last 10 years is how do we predict which students are gonna be at risk for a more complicated and prolonged recovery, even from a pretty simple concussion that might even be their first. So here we are, these are the different categories. Um, a history of headaches or migraines for the child, but it even makes a difference if there's a family history of migraines. It's not unusual for an injury like this to merely trigger an earlier onset of migraines for a child if there's a family history. Um, so we ask questions about all of these things. Um, a history of past concussions. So remember earlier when I mentioned that even after one concussion, that a child is three to six times more likely to have another one. The other important piece of that is that it can take less force and it may take longer to heal with each concussion. I always tell the story about one of my favorite patients who was a, um, an amazing soccer player and her last concussion happened when she sat down on the bench um, with force while she was playing and no one could believe it. They looked over the tapes there was no evidence of any sort of injury. And in fact, her brain had become so fragile that when she plopped herself down on the bench that it jostled her brain just enough to get another concussion. So you know your number's up when that happens, that's for sure. Um, a history of mental health problems, especially anxiety, can make recoveries more complicated. We know that anxiety can either cause or exacerbate headaches, nausea, dizziness, sleep disturbance, all those things. So it makes total sense that if a child is already struggling with those issues, if a concussion um, initiates some of those symptoms that they're gonna be even more difficult to manage. Um, new information, girls may take longer to resolve than boys. And if you're interested in this, I encourage you to go look up an organization called Pink Concussions because there's lots of fascinating research in this area. Um, the other things that I think are gonna be particularly important for you all to know is that we know for a fact that children with learning disabilities or attention problems diagnosed and undiagnosed are at greater risk for more complicated concussion recoveries. Um, a history of a lazy eye or vision issues, history of sleep disorders and history of motion sickness. Um, so we know for sure that it is not unusual if these sort of issues have either been bubbling under the surface or they've already been identified as being problematic and needing attention, that a concussion can make these worse or amplify them short-term and potentially long-term. All right, so how are you supposed to know what to do? Um, it's not easy and we get that, which is why we're here today. Um, so unfortunately, there is quite a bit of variability across different states in the US. So some states do have very specific notation in their concussion law about return to school and return to learn. However, even in those situations, generally what the language says is that the school needs to have a plan. Doesn't specify what the plan is, it just says that there needs to be a plan, which is fine. It gives us lots of flexibility to adjust to new research. Um, but even if your state does have information about this sort of language in the law in terms of return to school and return to learn, you're probably not gonna get specific guidance about what to do. And this is where I've tried to be very politically correct. So I said some state departments of education have created extensive guidelines for managing concussions. 
I would, I would qualify that and say a few. Um, Colorado in particular, you'll see me reference that later in the presentation, has unbelievable resources. So we haven't customized those for the state of South Carolina yet. Um, but the wonderful news is that you can use all those resources. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. They are out there, even though they're, they're labeled as Colorado Department of Education, we can still use them in South Carolina. Um, and so here again, many states actually have no statewide resources or recommendations. So the great news is since the start of our grant, we have taken ourselves out of that bottom category, which is exciting. Um, and we do have a few more resources. I know we have a lot more resources than we did even a few years ago. Those of us who've been working in this field in our state are super excited about the progress that we've made in the last couple of years, thanks to our grant. Um, so this is our grant. This is the, the gap that it was intended to, to fill, was to look for those national resources, try to figure out which ones we think would be the most helpful for you all, um, bring them to South Carolina, give you access to the national ones. If there were places where we needed to customize them, we have worked hard to try to do that. We're also reaching out regularly to providers and professionals in lots of different states to learn from their efforts. Um, fortunately, we're not alone in our quest to get better at managing children with concussions. And so we're able to compare notes with a lot of other states who are working along this path as well. Um, and that our grant obviously is intended to provide as much education as possible. There's not as lot that we can do to prevent these injuries, um, but that whatever we can do to enhance our ability to manage them, that really does make a difference in terms of a child's recovery. Um, so just in case you're not like me and you're not familiar with the um, South Carolina Student Athlete Concussion Law, which was passed June the 7th of 2013, it is in our um, REAP manual, but I also um, wanted to let you know that this is where, believe it or not, it was only in 2013 that we started having conversations about when a child should go back into the game. That's crazy to me. It's 2021 now, and it was only in 2013 that we had specific guidelines about return to play. That just blows my mind. The first law actually um, anywhere in the US was in 2009 in Washington state. So look at how far we've come. We weren't even providing guidance about return to play um, until those years. And now here we are trying to continue to move things forward. So you've heard me say already, these terms return to school and return to learn. And there's actually a difference. So at first we only talked about return to learn, which was great. We were trying to call people's attention to the fact that it was important to think about something bigger than just how fast Susie could get back into the soccer game. Um, so we talk now about the fact that oftentimes we need to differentiate between returning a child to school, to the building, to the classroom, versus returning them to their um, learning. So actually doing the schoolwork, taking the test, all of that. <clears throat> so we do differentiate these two things, but this is particularly important for schools to understand as well, that just because a child is sitting in a seat in the classroom for a certain number of hours of the day, it doesn't mean that they're ready to do all their work. And if we don't prepare them for this transition, oftentimes things go poorly. And if we don't have a plan, then we don't to know what to do when things do go poorly. And then oftentimes it's not unusual for someone to try to attend a few days, have a terrible experience, have their symptoms skyrocket, and then they'll come see me and they'll say, well, I never went back because it was a disaster. I ended up with a terrible headache. Um, so now we know Again, there's research to support these efforts of putting children back into the classroom as soon as possible. So remember when I talked earlier <clears throat> about cocooning is what we called it, where someone would stay home until they were completely symptom free. So we have actual research now documenting that there is no added benefit of this kind of strict rest. In fact, we saw that there were actually problems associated with this because more children were becoming depressed um, and then more children were struggling to make that adjustment when we told them it was time to go back to school. Remember I talked earlier about anxiety 
think about how much more anxious you would be going back to school. If you have been home for a month, you've been able to do very little to maybe some schoolwork, and then you plop yourself back in the classroom and you're a month behind. And it's really stressful to try to figure out how you're gonna keep up with new work and make up with old work. Um, so now what are the guidelines? How do we know? You know, I said a couple of days. Um, I, honestly, I laugh when I get guidelines from physicians that, that specify, I want this child to stay home for two weeks. And I'll say, well, how do you even know? A child might not need to stay home for two weeks. So we have very clear guidelines about this. Um, a child is ready to return to school with supports if their symptoms become tolerable, short-lived, and or amenable to rest and intervention. And what this means is that if a child sits down to do 30 minutes of work and they recognize that their headache increases a little bit with that sort of cognitive effort, if then if they can take a short break, they'll get something to drink, walk around a little bit, rest their eyes, that then their symptoms abate and then they can start to get a little bit more work done. So it's about trying to find that sweet spot we don't wanna to push too hard because then you end up with symptoms that then last for the rest of the day or potentially even longer than that. But if you can learn how to push a little bit and increase your tolerance for cognitive or physical effort and then rest and let your symptoms go back, then you have a really good chance of being able to build up where a child can stay for most of the school day. Um, so we have to have a plan. That's what we really want you to know. Um, so what do we know for sure, remember, about a typical concussion is that it can cause impairments or symptoms that can last for days or weeks or months. However, 70%, 70 to 80% of children and adolescents have experienced full resolution of their symptoms within a month. Um, so some people are missing just a few days of school, some are missing a good amount more than that, but we need to be prepared for either scenario. Um, we know this for sure, um, that if we handle things properly, that the risk of those long-term consequences that I mentioned earlier are much smaller. So we shouldn't be even worrying about graduation. If a child is injured in February, we should have time. Now, if they get injured in May, right before their exams, it gets a little hairy, um, but even still, we should definitely feel like that we're prepared because now we have more information. So this model should look super familiar to all of you in the education system. Um, and this is typically where I remind all school professionals that the vast majority of concussions should be easily managed in the regular classroom and without any formalized accommodation plans. However, your special education students are already placed into a higher level on this system. And we know from earlier in the presentation that they are already in some of those, sometimes even more than one of those high risk categories for having a more complex and prolonged recovery. And they're potentially at greater risk for long-term cognitive changes. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this next slide, um, but I just want you to know that there are tons of resources out there. And I mentioned this earlier, um, so that when you start to imagine a child sort of working their way up this triangle in terms of their level of need and their level of need for intervention and supports, then keep in mind as we share more information about these resources that you might find that different resources that we're telling you about today are gonna to be helpful at different stages in this process and for different students. Okay, so what are some common interventions in the school system? Um, so this is oftentimes the list that you'll see um, provided to you on a checklist from a medical provider. Um, shortening the school day, like partial day attendance, um, limited screen time, um, avoiding lights and noisy places like hallways, um, rest periods, sometimes in a room where there's less sensory stimulation. Um, so this obviously means that we wanna consider taking a child out of band and orchestra and chorus and PE class and recess are often the ones that we think about immediately because 
one of the things that we know in terms of return to play, obviously, is that we wanna do everything that we can to make sure that a child doesn't get another concussion while they're still actively recovering from their first one. So everyone immediately thinks about, you know, exposure in terms of sports and PE class, um, but oftentimes they forget about recess. Um, and this is heartbreaking for a child to have to miss out on recess. So we have to get creative about ways that maybe they can still play with a small number of friends, but in a different area of the playground. So they're not at risk for getting hit in the head with a ball. Um, as far as some of the academic accommodations that are oftentimes discussed in these simple checklists that you'll get from, um, from medical providers are things like adjusting assignments, um, delaying testing until we know that they're capable of giving their best effort and providing accurate data in terms of their knowledge, um, splitting up their test into smaller chunks or their assignments that way, and then obviously delaying any standardized testing. Um, however, um, these are a pretty simple list. And so we're gonna talk a lot more today about more things that can be helpful. And then how do you know about which of these supports and accommodations might be helpful for that individual child? Um, that's my biggest um, complaint sometimes about the checklist that I get is that they'll have these listed out. And then if a child has a pretty significant concussion, then what you'll see from the MD is that they just check all of them. <laughs> um, and so then my question always is, well, how do you even know which ones are important? We need to figure out what each child needs because we never want to over accommodate. Um, we want to provide exactly what that child needs. Okay. Um, so here's my tutorial on, on more providing more information on, on the different types of symptoms that can occur. You know, I talked earlier about making sure that everyone is aware that you can have physical symptoms and there's a wide range of physical symptoms. So it's not just headaches, it's not just dizziness. It can actually be balance and coordination problems. You'll see a child being kind of wobbly or not being able to walk in a straight line or stand on one foot. Um, light sensitivity or blurred vision, difficulty with depth perception, taking vision from close up to far away, noise sensitivity and neck pain, particularly when there's been an injury that has caused that movement in the cervical area that can actually cause damage that can contribute to different symptoms as well. Um, so cognitive symptoms, and I'm gonna spend a lot of my presentation talking about these, but just as an introduction, difficulty with things like um, concentration and focus and attention, um, memory problems are reported, feeling foggy and slow. Um, those are all super common reports that we have after a concussion. Emotional symptoms, and it was years before we started talking to families about this, and a lot of times, unfortunately, um, families are not informed that this is a really normal part of a concussion. Um, being more easily upset, crying all the time, getting angry, um, being frightened, having panic attacks, um, just grumpiness and irritability. And the tricky part is, is that a lot of times when they're adolescents, you know, it's hard to differentiate between what's a teenager, uh, what's just a teenager, what's a teenager with a concussion. <laughs> it's hard. Um, that's what makes my job fun, I think. Um, and then this other category is super important to remember. And I love that Karen McAvoy in the REIT manual separates this out so that we make sure that we ask questions um, and we gather data about what's going on in terms of sleep um, and energy because a lot of these children have a lot of trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. Others will tell me that they're sleeping all the time and it makes it really difficult to even stay at school because they get so tired so easily. And I'm gonna talk a lot about that um, later in the presentation. But this is important to know. So remember how we talked about the, the letters R-E-A-P, but the E in REAP actually means that we should let the symptoms, let us specific child symptoms, educate us about what that child needs. All right. So there's more in terms of how symptoms organize themselves. And, and this is where actually the bulk of the recovery in, in concussion management um, has evolved over the last couple of years. And, and I obviously find this super fascinating. And I think you will as well, um, because we know this, that there are, there are actually three different categories of reasons why 
um, a child will experience some more prolonged recovery. Um, so there are those symptoms that are actually linked specifically to the injury um, that didn't exist prior to the injury, that are new, and that are just simply not resolving on their own or not even resolving with specific interventions and rehabilitation. Um, and that's that, that piece of the pie called concussion originated. Um, but then there's this, the, the piece called concussion exacerbated. And this is super tricky to differentiate a lot of times when a child may have some struggles in these areas even before their injury, but then they're reporting or maybe even not reporting um, perceived changes, but we're noticing either we as their medical providers or as their teachers and educational providers or as their parents that we're noticing what may be changes in these areas, um, short and long-term. And then this bottom piece of the pie, these are the ones who typically make it to me. Um, and this is where there are all these other factors involved that are making it really difficult for all the people trying to take care of this child to figure out, well, how can we help and what is exactly going on? Um, and we call this misattribution um, because oftentimes it's complicated. You know, families will come to me and believe that everything that they're experiencing is concussion and concussion alone, but it may be that they had undiagnosed and unmanaged anxiety prior to their concussion, that now this has just been the tipping point, particularly with that emotional dysregulation that's so common with concussions. Um, sometimes even we'll see depression associated with their injury, their removal from sport, their isolation from peers, that then can contribute to fatigue, difficulty concentrating, because we know depression can cause those, those things as well, even in the absence of a concussion. Um, it is so important um, to remember that, that these are children and sometimes they are gonna try to take advantage of the system if they didn't really care about school before or they didn't like school or they were experiencing social problems at school then they may be tempted to exaggerate their symptoms or avoid school and this is really tricky um, because we want to listen and again like we don't have I can't do blood work I can't do an x-ray and I can't confirm exactly where a child is in his or her recovery um, but if they're telling me that their headaches are terrible and that whenever they go to school they get worse it takes a lot of work to get to the underlying factors sometimes in order to um, understand that they might actually be avoiding school and exaggerating their symptoms. Um, the other piece that I know you all as educators are well aware of is that parental anxiety um, can play a big role. You know, there are lots of parents who are super tolerant of their children's distress. And then there are also lots of parents who really cannot tolerate their child being in distress. So those are the parents that we really have to push hard and say, look, it's not helping your child's recovery to keep them home until they're symptom free. I get that it's gonna be hard. Sometimes it's gonna cause flares in their symptoms, but that they're gonna be okay because we have a plan. And that is, that's what makes a big difference in terms of parental anxiety about sending a child back to school is if a parent is confident that their child have their school has a good plan and that everyone is communicating, it makes a huge difference. Um, all right, so that gets us to our next slide, which in a lot of ways, I don't need to teach you all how to communicate with parents, but I'm gonna give you a few pointers about how to communicate with parents about concussions in particular. Um, so first of all, reach out to those parents if you see changes or symptoms that cause you concern. Um, and trust your gut, you know your students. I always tell families that I don't, when I do my neuropsychological testing for these cases, I refuse to do it unless I can get input from a teacher because you all have this normative, beautiful normative sample in front of you at all times so that you can tell if a child is sticking out from the group in terms of their ability to focus or learn or remember. You also know your students. Now this is, a little trickier early in the school year when you're just getting to know a child because then it's harder for you to make those pre and post concussion comparisons. Um, but I, I really think you'd surprise yourselves even after a little bit of time with a student, you'll notice if that child is constantly 
putting his head down on his desk or refusing to do work and that was not a problem initially, then that can be an indicator that there's something more going on. Um, hopefully, parents report an injury, but they oftentimes don't do this, believe it or not. Like let's say a child falls off of his bike over the weekend, um, they may or may not have even gone to the pediatrician to get him checked out. And then suddenly he's in your classroom all week and you're scratching your head because Billy just doesn't look like he did before. Something is up. Um, all the more reason to pick up the phone and call that parent. And you might get the answer that you've been looking for, which is, well, you know what? He did have a fall while he was playing with his brother in the yard. Um, it's also so important to gather information about what the parent is seeing at home. <coughs> and what you're seeing at school. Um, this doesn't mean that one person is right and the other person is wrong, but you're really able to assess the differences in those environments. And then also a big part of that is stamina. So a child really may look pretty darn good for most of the school day, but then get home, cry the whole way home, get in bed as soon as they get home and collapse. So. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you're communicating with each other so that you can brainstorm because that's not an outcome that we're looking for. And then I want you to know how to adjust that child's school day so that we can prevent that sort of total crash and burn in the afternoon and the evening. Um, I would also, here's my personal plug, like always ask the family if you can communicate with their medical providers. Um, because a lot of times medical providers don't even know how to reach out to you. They don't have contact information for you. Um, you know, they wouldn't know the first way about being able to get information from you. So if you have information that you feel like would be helpful for the medical doctors that are taking care of that child, sometimes you can trust the parent to pass that information on. Um, but you can also, and school nurses in particular are very used to picking up the phone and calling medical doctors. So feel free to do that. Don't be shy about providing information to some of these concussion doctors. The specialists in particular would love to have your input. Um, so how does your school handle short-term student needs? Because a lot of times this is all you need to know at the beginning. You know, for those first couple days, that first week or so, when we're still operating under the assumption that this student's gonna be able to make a full recovery within a couple weeks, um, so think in terms of like, how do y'all handle it if a child has a broken arm um, with their arm that they write with? You know, how much flexibility do you have as a classroom teacher to make small adjustments that you know are needed based on that injury? What if a child is out of school for a week, you know, with some sort of sickness, um, and then they come back to school? How flexible are you able to be in terms of adjusting assignments and deadlines and things like that? Um, if there's a family stressor or a death in the family and a child misses school for a while to go to a funeral, but then you also know that they're just not 100% and they're struggling more, um, then it's so important to have information about what you're able to do on your own without anybody's permission. At what point does your school require you to come up with a more specific and formal plan? And then how, e how easy is it to amend plans as you move forward? And this is particularly important for these students who already have a 504 or an IEP. Um, because unfortunately what happens a lot of times is that people think, well, this child already has a plan for ADHD. So I'm sure all the things that we're already doing for him or her will, will be applicable and be sufficient during their concussion recovery, but that, that is probably not the case because a child with ADHD is not having headaches or light sensitivity or stamina issues, um, even though they might have some of the same attention and processing speed issues. Um, but it also may be that their ADHD symptoms are worse during their recovery. And so they may not have needed quite as many supports for their ADHD before their injury. Um, so unfortunately, each school district and each school, even within a district, oftentimes manage these types of issues in different ways. Um, so for me, when every school that I work with, I have to sort of truly go to those meetings and say, help me understand how things work at your school. You know, what do, what do you need from me? How does that process um, play out in terms of our making plans to support this child in the classroom? Um, each school, has a different point person. And some people 
if they have some schools, if they have specific concussion plans, then they might even have a point person for concussions. Otherwise, a lot of times it ends up being who is the point person for medical issues. And a lot of times that's the school nurse. Sometimes it is a 504 coordinator. Um, but I'm going to challenge you all as special education teachers to say that you know your children better than anyone and can advocate for them better than anyone. Um, so close collaboration between whoever holds that title in your school and you as their classroom teacher is super important. All right, so as I mentioned before, um, there are real consequences for mismanagement. So it's so important to take these steps. Um, all right, I am taking up a lot of time and I'm gonna try to speed it up. Okay, <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier, a lot of those physical symptoms and here is a summary of things that you might see in the classroom um, for each of the different areas of symptoms. Um, so I'm not gonna run through each one of those specifically, um, but just think in terms of the signs that you might see in the classroom and what they may indicate. Or if you get medical information from a parent or a doctor saying that this child has vestibular problems or ocular motor problems, then you know to think about these sorts of supports and accommodations. Um, the wonderful Dr. Katie Davis Tarver with the Vision Therapy Institute has provided even additional information for us in terms of um, considerations for supports and accommodations for remote learning. Hopefully this pandemic is not gonna last forever, um, but I do think that remote learning is probably here to stay in some sort of capacity. So it's different, those considerations are different um, when we're thinking about how to support children <clears throat> with visual deficits. Okay, so I'm gonna blow through a little bit more information about some of the most common cognitive symptoms. So I just wanna make sure that I'm a psychologist and that you all get a little bit more meat from me about the things that are um, the symptoms that I deal with every day. Um, so there are three big categories of symptoms slash changes slash deficits that are super common after a concussion. So the first one we talked a little bit about earlier, which is that mental fatigue or decreased cognitive stamina, um, or even physical symptoms. How do we manage those in the classroom? Um, the second one is slowed processing speed or difficulty getting work done efficiently and effectively. And the third one is deficits in short-term memory or learning. And all of those, as we know well, can affect a, a child's daily functioning in the classroom. Um, so that first one, you know, one of the things that I didn't mention earlier that I meant to you is that I want you all to understand um, all these different factors that are involved in concussions and concussion recoveries, but I also want you to feel comfortable being able to explain them to your students, to the parents, um, and to even other teachers who you work with. Um, so some of these slides are super basic, but I think it just helps you be able to come up with a way to explain to a child, instead of saying that you're having trouble with mental fatigue or cognitive stamina, you know, you can say, look, I think your, your battery is dis, you know, you're on red, we need to plug you in and recharge you and send you to the nurse's office so that you can rest for a little bit. Um, I oftentimes say um, to children and families, it's like your car goes from getting 35 miles per gallon to about, you know, eight or nine miles per gallon when you're recovering from a concussion. Um, so your brain, you know, we talked about that functional limitation and whenever you tax it, it just gets wiped out a lot more quickly because your brain is truly in an energy crisis. Um, so some of the most common ways for us to support these sorts of needs um, are giving them breaks, um, you know, making sure that they can either do that break in the classroom or that they can go somewhere else um, to take a break. Um, the slowed processing speed and workload management is so critical. Um, so remember, I mentioned earlier that some of these children, you know, some of them have been home for a couple days, sometimes even longer than that, um, unfortunately, and then they're coming back to school and it's not like they're 100%. It would be difficult to manage the new work and the old work, even if they were 100%, but they are not 100% yet. Um, so they can't work for as long a periods of time, and we talked about that a minute ago in terms of stamina. But even when they do work, it takes them longer to think and remember and problem solve. 
Um, and this is the part I would say where we get the most um, pushback from some teachers, hopefully not you all, um, but this idea that, that we're gonna ask a teacher to look at assignments and think really carefully about what is actually essential. And this is hard because I worked in a school for seven years and I know that teachers work really hard and make sure that every single assignment is important. So, so by saying this, I'm not at all saying that, that you know, their baseline is giving a bunch of um, superfluous work, not at all. Um, but it's super important to think in terms of if our primary goal is to make sure that the child masters the content and learns the skills then what is the most efficient way that we can do that? Um, making that so much more manageable. And this is easier for younger children when you can think in terms of, well, only do the odd problems on your math homework tonight, or you know, sort of pick pick which of these pick, pick which of these essay questions that you're going to write. Um, the older students, it does get a fair amount trickier um, when it's time to adjust those assignments. I understand that. Um, so you're focusing on the, the quality of their learning, though, not how many times that they can document that they've learned it. Um, oftentimes, too, it's important to think with the slow processing speed about the encoding of new information, not just the child's ability to produce um, the work. And so it's so funny when I'll be doing my testing and all of a sudden I will realize that a child's processing speed is super slow. Um, and I'm talking particularly fast today so that I can get through all this information, but then suddenly I'll realize, wow, I need to slow the pace of my speech um, while I'm talking to this child. Otherwise, I dramatically reduce the chances that they're even gonna be able to catch all that information that I'm throwing at them. Um, so memory, and this is so common for families to come to me and say, I'm having a memory problem. And I'm gonna to talk to you about this a little bit more in a minute when I show you one of these great websites. Um, but it is, it is very common. Um, there can be several different causes for it, um, but for children and families to say that, um, that they're having memory problems. So obviously this is gonna affect a child's ability to then show you what he or she has learned when it comes to times for assessments which is why it's really important if there are reported struggles in this area to think about more creative ways to assess, whether it's a presentation um, or so an open book test or something that will allow the child to show you what he or she has learned, but then not have all that anxiety about fears that they're having trouble actually recalling information that they've learned. So here's some more examples of things that you can do. Um, so like I said, those are really just three of the big areas and probably the big three, although I might, I might argue that attention um, would be also right up there in those top um, categories as far as typical symptoms and impairments. Um, so because I'm not gonna keep you here all day, I wanna make sure that you have all the resources that you need for whatever you notice that your student is struggling with. So remember, that's what that E is all about is it's about figuring out what is that specific student struggling with and then how do I measure that and then how do I make sure that I'm providing specific supports to address that individual need. Um, so remember I said Colorado has been a superstar and in large part due to Dr. Karen McAvoy who developed that REAP manual um, but here are some fabulous resources. So um, they have this um, enormous um, manual for brain injury in children and youth. Um, and it is created by the Colorado Department of Education. And I'm not kidding when I tell you that anything and everything that you could possibly want to know is in that manual. Um, another fantastic resource that I'm gonna walk you through a bit again in a minute um, is this Colorado Kids with Brain Injury website. So I talked about assessment. Um, well, I know you as educators love data and I love data. Um, so, so I'm gonna give you more information about specific tests that may actually already be present in your school districts with your school psychologist. Um, but this is another one. Um, and this is called the Neurocognitive Evaluation Form. And this one, you know, we talked about all those different categories of symptomology. 
that this test actually is just a little checklist that you can complete based on all your observations of that child to help you figure out where their biggest needs are and what sort of supports might be the most helpful. All right, so here is this website um, that I mentioned earlier called this Colorado Kids with Brain Injury.com. And now I'm going to try to test my technological abilities and take you to that website for just a minute. Uh, and Katie's here to rescue me if I have problems. Um, okay, um, so hopefully you can see what I'm looking at on my screen now, and you can see where there's you can even give this website to parents because there are lots of resources for parents under the parent tab. But I'm going to click on this educators and professionals tab so that I can give you um, a sneak peek at everything that's here that you can use. Because I don't know about you, but when I watch presentations, sometimes I hear about lots of websites and I never go. So I decided to show you all the resources that are there. So see, you've got that manual right here in electronic form. So the truth is, is that all you really need is this website. Um, it's a tab on my computer, um, but, um, but make sure that you remember how to get to this website because that manual is there for your reading pleasure. Um, but then this one in particular, this tab that's called building blocks is just a wealth of information. Um, I mean, you could, I can spend hours. Um, I think you could probably spend hours as well. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this section, which gives you specific um, labels for different um, cognitive processes so that you can get a feel for um, where you're assessing what needs that you might wanna be addressing. So you should be able to see where I'm scrolling down now, and then it lists all of those different building blocks on the left and see I clicked on attention. You can see common, um, behaviors that you will see in the classroom. Um, and because we all know that sometimes it's easy to see when a child is distracted, but sometimes it's more subtle. Um, so it gives you gentle reminders of all the things to look for, um, how those sorts of deficits in attention might affect their academic performance. And then look at this. Um, these are all tests that can be administered if you want to measure and look to be able to tell you sort of exactly what does their ability to stay focused look like? How does it compare to the general population? Um, now, some of these children, if they have IEPs, um, because let's say they had um, pre-concussion ADHD, then you might actually have some of this data before, which is my fantasy when it comes time for assessments is when I have baseline data, and then you can give some of the same tests again to see how they're different now then you really have beautiful data on where the changes are. It is important, however, to remember, if you do new testing, remember at what point in their recovery that you're doing that testing. So if you do new testing of attention a month after their injury, because you're worrying, well, this is one of those children who's going to be in that 20 to 30 percent that's not going to be fully recovered, then make sure that you present that data to a parent not by saying this is your child's new baseline, but by saying this is where your child's attention is now in their recovery. So then we may wanna measure that again in a couple months when your child feels like they've had a full recovery. Now, some of these tests, you know, we can only administer um, at certain specified frequencies. So you do have to be careful, but that's the beautiful part about why there's so many measures in here that you can use. Um, then it gives you specific ideas about environmental supports and accommodations. And then it also gives you more detailed information about resources and interventions. And this is true for every single one of these different building blocks. So um, the beautiful part is I don't have to walk through each one of these with you, but now you're gonna be able to have these and you're gonna be able to look um, and see exactly what you need based on the needs of your child. Okay. All right, we're back to the PowerPoint and I'm gonna to try to wrap this up and pass the baton over to Katie. Um, so the reason that I wanted to go back and spend a teeny bit of time on these building blocks is to call your attention to the fact that if there is disruption with any of those fundamental processes that what you'll see is you'll see some unraveling in those higher order processes as well. And I love this slide because like I said, attention is one of the most common um, symptoms, deficits in attention. 
um, is one of the most common difficulties after a concussion. So look, that one simple thing that it's harder for a child to focus, then suddenly all these different pieces of the puzzle start to fall apart, which is why they come to me so often and they'll say I'm having memory problems. Um, and I always nod and say, okay, great. Let's figure out what's going on because it may not be memory at all. It might be attention. I always say attention is like the net in which you catch all the data that's coming towards you. So if you have holes in your net because you have deficits in attention, then it's gonna feel like a memory problem. But the problem is you never actually caught that information in your net. So when you go back to look for it later, um, it's not there but it's not because you can't find it or you have a memory deficit, it's because you have an attention deficit. Um, I did wanna do one last slide too about sort of, again, I mean, I think you can't work in concussions if you're not flexible and willing to learn. Um, so this year has been a new dance, um, which is trying to figure out, well, sort of what are the classic supports and accommodations that we use for these specific symptoms and deficits after concussions? And then how do we wanna adjust those if a child is learning from home? So there have been some benefits, I'm not gonna lie. There's a lot more flexibility if a child is home and on their computer, then they can obviously rest anytime they need to. A lot of lectures are recorded anyway um, so that they can replay them when they need to. We're not at all having conversations about noisy halls and, and fluorescent lights. You know, you can fix your lights in your child's um, home little desk any way that you like to. Um, there's also a lot less concern about missing classes for medical appointments if all those lectures are recorded anyway. However, we're talking about a lot more screen time. And one of the things that we um, oftentimes caution um, students and families and teachers about is that you know oftentimes it's helpful for a child to do more work paper and pencil rather than being on their Chromebook or their iPad all the time. So it becomes problematic if a child is supposed to be looking at a computer screen all day. Um, so we have to be a little creative. Um, that social isolation that which is one of the reasons why we wanted children to get back in school as soon as possible. Um, well, that's been a problem for everybody this past year. Um, so we do have to pay extra close attention to the fact that that has, can be an issue in terms of their recovery as well, particularly when it comes to their mood. I have found it to be much more difficult for my patients to get um, individual access to teachers, like to get extra help. Um, teachers are overwhelmed and overloaded and I, uh, I cannot even imagine what this last year has been like for them. Um, and so it is difficult to ask them to schedule additional Zoom meetings or phone calls with students. Whereas it used to be super easy to say, well, Johnny's gonna stop by and, and see you first thing in the morning and go over those math problems you know, every morning because he's struggling. Um, a lot of students, even those without concussions, are having more trouble keeping up with assignments and deadlines. Um, and it is much harder for you amazing teachers to be able to see when a child is struggling. You know, we talked earlier about how much I trust your um, behavioral observations, but if you're trying to observe a child through the computer, it's a lot more difficult to tell when they're struggling and having a hard time. Um, computerized testing in particular has been um, a nightmare um, because, um, you know, we talk about already how difficult it is for some of these children to be looking down and looking up if they're allowed to um, use a paper and pencil to do scratch work before they answer the question um, on the computer. There's a lot more chance that they're going to make a careless error if they're having trouble holding details in their head. And we know this about children with ADHD, so why wouldn't it be true? for children with concussions. Um, some of these tests even don't allow you to go back um, and check your work or to skip a problem if it's really hard for you and then go back and work on it later. So I've had to talk to schools about making specific um, allowances for some of these um, students to be able to do exactly that. Um, so if we know that they're having stamina issues, they might have flares in their symptoms, they might need more breaks, they're gonna need to go back and be able to check their work. Um, so in conclusion for me, and then I'm gonna pass the baton over to Katie, um, you know your students, um, trust your gut, and you now you know a lot more about concussions, I'm excited to say. Um, 
Don't be afraid to ask questions and advocate for your um, students. You don't have to have all the answers. You just have to recognize that there's a problem and start those conversations. Um, asking for new test data is super important and comparing it to baseline testing. Um, schools love to do testing. Now, unfortunately, the system, if it's limited to you know, going through the entire IEP process, it can be sort of cumbersome and, and time intensive, which is not a good fit for concussion recovery. Um, but if you've got a good school psychologist who can pop her head in or pull your child for 30 minutes and do some processing speed tests, then you're gonna have a lot more information than just by going on their report. Because remember, their perception of symptoms is not always a directly accurate, that it might actually be another one of those building blocks that's causing them problems. Um, my hope is that after today, that you're going to be able to clearly um, explain concussion symptoms to your students so that they can advocate for themselves with their other teachers and with the other adults in their life. Um, just because a student has a plan from before their concussion doesn't mean that those accommodations are still the right ones or enough with the addition of their concussion. Um, and don't assume that they are back to their baseline until you confirm it. Um, so it may be that their physical symptoms have really gone away, um, but that when it comes to the cognitive ones, it's not unusual for them to linger a little while longer. So now I'm going to pass the baton to the fabulous Katie Zinger so she can talk a little bit more about those resources that we said that we've brought those national resources to South Carolina for you to be able to use on a regular basis. Well, I'm thank you, Ashley. That was an incredible amount of material. I love hearing you talk about this stuff you're able to really um, put it in a context. I think that people, it helps it process a little easier for all of us. So um, if you'll go to the next slide, Ashley. So we have something called Get Schooled on Concussions. Uh, through this grant, uh, we have very uh, luckily been able to take some of our funding and prepay through 2024 for a subscription to what's called Get Schooled on Concussions. And we have a South Carolina um, uh, specific subscription. So any educator and actually anyone, this is mostly meant for educators, but um, who wants to can go to the, the page you see here and you'll get a, there's a password. This image, the, are you ready to get school on concussions with the laptop and that sort of thing. There is an image like this uploaded with the rest of the documents, the rest of the materials for this presentation. So you can go um, to either the www.braininjurysafetynetsc.com and go to our Get Schooled on Concussions tab, or you can go to getschooledonconcussions.com and log in under South Carolina and um, you can have access to an incredible amount of resources, one of which is this thing called, you can see it in the middle here on the little laptop screen, it's orange, the Teacher Acute Concussion Tool, which is called, or TACT. And that is a email-based symptom management um, uh, service, basically, for classroom teachers to, in order to help them manage their students' concussion symptoms in the classroom. So basically, it's a once a week prescription, if you will, of like what the, the kinds of accommodations might be necessary for a student who's um, in your classroom that you've gone in and put the symptoms into the teacher acute, con teacher acute concussion tool, and then they will automatically send you an email every week with information about how to help that specific child's um, symptoms and with uh, adjustments uh, in the classroom, right? Not accommodations, right? Actually, adjustments. Okay. Um, so if you go to the next page, you can see our, oh, the what's going to be more important for y'all, in addition to the tact, there's also a wealth of tip sheets. So this, these are, um, again, about return to learn, and they're built off of that MTSS pyramid. And so this is the tier two related services and each of the circles that you see, those tip sheets are uploaded additionally in um, our packet of resources and materials for this conference. So um, the ascending levels of support, the MTSS tier tip sheet, that's there, phases of recovery, that's there. These are all of those tier two 
um, specific tip sheets that y'all might want to immediately access. So you can either access it for free going onto the website, or we've got these PDFs already uploaded for you in this folder. Next slide. And again, want to shout out our our grant, the South Carolina um, page is that brain injury safety net se.com. And as you can see up here on our little tabs, we have get schooled on concussions there. So you can request access to the portal. You can go ahead and check out a whole bunch of other information. We also have the entire resources tab here that is um, divvied out by the type of professionals or the type of materials for families, types of materials for healthcare providers, types of materials for educators. So we've got a lot of great resources that have been hand selected by our champions and concussion experts that are on our task force. And we really just encourage you to go to the website and look through it and get all the information that you might need. Of course, the REIT manual is up there. It's also available online in Spanish, um, but the South Carolina version, we don't have that translated, but at least you have a, the basics um, and you can download that online in Spanish from our website here. Great. And then of course, uh, we have not just the REIT manual online, we also have beautiful hard copies like I showed you in the beginning. Um, and we have them to mail to you for free. Uh, you just need to email me, safety net coordinator at biafsc.com. That's in the, at the end of the slideshow. You can find my email address and just request hard copies and give us an address. So we really wanna make sure that this gets into the hands of folks who need it. So thank you so much for being here with us today and taking the time to listen to um, the entire presentation. And if you have any questions at all, please see my, um, my email address here. And there's also a contact form on the website. We check all of that. So thank you. Last thing, oh my gosh, this is so important for grant stuff. I know that there are so many assessments and so many things, but this is quick, like less than, I think it's about four minutes it takes to complete this. But if you could please take your phone right now, if you're watching the recording, you can pause it. Uh, and then you take your phone, open up your camera app, and you should be able to scan that QR code. A little link will pop up to SurveyMonkey, and you can just fill it out on your phone right now while you're thinking about it at the end. We'll also provide this link in a Word document in our uploaded, doc, um, uploaded materials along with this presentation. So thank you for being here. Please, please, please fill out the survey and contact us at the Brain Injury Association of South Carolina if you have any questions or need any additional resources.